Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today's one is going to be, do you need to be rich to ride? From being in the equine world for most of my life, I have heard lots of different stereotypes from non-horsey people and also horsey people around certain things. And I feel like this is a big one. I think a lot of people think that you have to be extremely wealthy to have horses. And also, especially in the dressage industry, I feel that it's looked at as quite like an elitist sport and also quite a posh sport. So today we are gonna be talking over the reality of it. And we are also going to go and visit some different people who come from different financial situations about how they go about it. Um, we're gonna have people who just do it for fun and we're also gonna have people who compete to a high level. I'm gonna to explain to you as well a little bit about my background. If you guys know me, you will know that I have been very lucky that my parents have supported me 100% with the horses and that's also they've supported me financially and I know I'm extremely lucky with that but there are also things that we go about um, doing to make things financially easier for us. So I'm under no false illusion that owning horses, riding horses, competing horses is cheap. Obviously you need the money to be able to firstly just look after the horse, to feed it, um, if you need the vet to have that, to have their teeth checked, because it's really important that when you go into saying, okay, I wanna own a horse, that you can give that horse the care it needs. But I'm also really passionate about explaining to people that you do not need all the top gear, like the top tack, the top clothing, the top everything, to build a relationship with that horse, to go out and compete. At the end of the day, the horses do not care if they are in the most fancy rug or the most fancy bridle and saddle. As long as they fit them comfortably, that's all they care about. As long as the horse gets to, gets, gets to have good food, um, gets water, gets to go out and about in the field, that's all they really care about. So I think sometimes, and especially in dressage, people go, oh, well, I haven't got the money to buy all the fancy gear. Um, I feel like the media doesn't have that either because that's a lot of the time what they show is the more elite riders who have gone through a journey themselves. I'm not just saying all the elite riders have come from money because a lot of them haven't. They've gone through a journey themselves and a lot of the time the media just shows that and we don't see the reality of say getting to that stage or of people who are doing it without that. I guess my first point is that don't feel you can't um, compete or own a horse because say you can't afford the top end of stuff. At the end of the day, as long as the horse is happy and you have a good relationship with them, that's all that truly matters. So as I explained before, I've been very lucky that my parents have supported me with my riding career and I didn't want to sit here and just kind of preach on it. I wanted to go and talk to people who have really had to budget um, to keep their horses and yeah, to kind of hear their side of the story. So let's head over and listen to them. It's an expensive sport. You can't, there's no way of denying that, however you mm. do it. I mean, I'd probably do it as cheaply as is possible, mm. apart from the quantity of horses. I couldn't possibly have four at livery, for instance. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, from that point of view, I do it as cheaply as I can. I can understand people not choosing to insure horses because um, it is very expensive and horse insurance isn't great from the point of view of exclusion. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I currently pay, pay more insurance for the one that is excluded for both her high oh. limbs than I do, than I do for the other. So, but that is, you know, it is a choice. Yeah. Um, and I, for instance, just know that if one of them had a colic or anything, like yeah. that, I couldn't come up with a thousand of pounds. Yeah, 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 you're the only, yeah I'm covered. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's definitely a lifestyle choice. It's not, um, 
it's not a hobby. Mm. It's not something you could pick up and put back down again and think, oh well, yeah. things were a bit It's not like a tennis isn't? racket. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. There are things that you can do to sacrifice, you know, to, to sort of make it work financially. Uh, for instance, you know, there are more expensive months and you might have to choose not to compete as much yeah. or not to have as much training. Yeah. You can pair it back. Um, but from my point of view, um, yeah, we might not have as many weekends away and holidays and things like that, but you, you come, this, this is all the time, this is our life. Yeah. Uh, this isn't. This is something that our whole family get involved with as well. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to know it's not impossible. Absolutely, no, it's, it's not because it's not that impossible. stereotype of it just being for the very rich is oh, no, no, irritating. No. Yeah, no, 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 no. no. It's, it's it's not impossible. Um, but you, and you've got to love it enough to want to do it. Um, so you spoke a little bit about your horse yeah. and how you afforded to get him and how you couldn't get like a ready-made one. Do you want to just speak a little bit more? Yeah, so I got Smithy um, last September mm. um, and I've been looking for ages. I'd lost mine a year ago and I thought I'm ready now to get another horse. I couldn't afford to spend that, you know, four, five, six grand yeah. on something that was already produced that would give me the confidence to then go on. Mm. But actually I, I couldn't. So um, Smithy he was just under 2k yeah um he's got the basics he's yeah. x race horse he's raced twice um but it's now that i'm having to produce it so ha it's it's a balancing on those scales yeah. do you get something do you spend a little bit more that gives you the confidence or do you spend a little bit less and know you've got to put the work in but actually you can learn together build mm, together and get that confidence yeah, definitely, together definitely um, and if someone said to you, do you think, you, do you need to be rich to ride, what would you say? No. <laughs> no. Um, you need to have uh, a bit of expendable income, I yeah. would say. Um, but I was saying to a friend of mine that I don't really go out and drink, I don't shop, mm. uh, I don't go out and party. Uh, my horse is, I'm self-employed, I yeah. do between 40 and 60 hours a week. Yeah. And he is the one thing that I look forward to. He is my hobby that I can come out and relax and go, do you know what, I don't have to think about work for yeah. a couple of hours, I can enjoy him. Yeah. Whilst making this video, I stumbled across a post from a lady called Steph Cropsford and she is someone from the UK and I've always been um, in awe of her and I've always had so much admiration for her because she has taken, um, the post was that she'd taken three horses from Square One to Grand Prix and the amazing thing about this is that they are all cart horses. So they're not your typical dressage horse. So I really wanted to get her in on this video, but because she lives so far away from me, I decided to send her a few questions and get her reply. So I firstly asked her, if someone said to you, you have to be rich to own horses and compete in dressage, what would your response be? She said, we do dressage on a shoestring. Simon and I have no help. We are up at 5.50 a.m. every morning to do our yard jobs and ride at 6.50 before work. I've not competed much this year as we can't afford it. I would rather put money into my training with Mr. D than waste money on competing when we are not ready for the challenge. Steph has trained three horses to Grand Prix and I asked her if it had been challenging financially and if so, how has she made it work? Her response was, yes, it has been challenging, definitely. Right from the days of Mr. P, I could only afford a lesson with Richard about once every six weeks. He would give me an exercise to go home and practice. When I could do those, I would return to be given more homework. We treated competing the horses abroad as a holiday with the kids and just take a horse with us. That's why we try and pick places that we all would like to go to and we can hire a car and go exploring. I finished with asking what her drive was to push through any adversity and I absolutely love her reply. I think my drive is to show people that you don't have to conform to a type in order to achieve a goal. At the end of the day, I'm a slightly overweight, middle-aged ex-rugby player riding a cart horse. If I can do it, anyone can. There are so many different stories within the equine world about how people have done it financially. And like I know um, from just reading articles and listening to people that a lot of the professional top riders, they didn't have massive financial support when they first started and they made it they made it possible. So I think that's really inspiring as well. And I think that we need to talk about that more and we need to be more open and honest about that. But the story I can tell you is the story of me. Um, and it's one that is, it, I find really hard talking about sometimes. So basically, 
Um, I left school at 16 and I went to be a working pupil um, on a big uh, competition yard and I basically worked for my lessons. So I started work at seven o'clock in the morning and we finished work quite late because there's a lot of work to do on a yard. And it was really hard work, but it was really nice to to get that experience. So that is kind of how I broke my way into the equestrian world. Um, what's really cool about this is that you can work for your lessons. So say you can't afford them, it's a really good way in. Um, so whilst I was working at that yard, the opportunity came available for us for us to buy um, a schoolmaster for me to do the um, GB team stuff on, so the um, young riders, the juniors, to ride for Great Britain, which is an amazing opportunity and I'm also always, always thankful for it. So anyway, I had that amazing opportunity and then I came home and things changed a little bit and we couldn't afford to buy the produced horses anymore so the more advanced horses so we went to buying the young horses so um say they were three or four they're a lot cheaper because they haven't had the training put into them um and the time so they're more affordable so we had to switch to doing that which you could look at it as being like oh kind of I, well, I've never looked at it as being a bad thing. I mean, some people would say, oh, it's it's kind of annoying because you have to then wait for the horse to get older. But to be totally honest, I think, I think it made me a much better rider not being given a produced horse. Um, having to learn to take a horse from square one to now, okay, one of my horses is about to do a Grand Prix. Learning to do that, I think, is priceless. Um, I think sometimes money doesn't necessarily make you a better rider. Of course it makes things easier. Of course it does. Um, you can get more training, you can get more this and that. But being bought a very expensive horse doesn't make you, it doesn't make you be able to ride it. You have to learn to ride it. And I think, um, you know, because I've had the horses that we had, they were not the most talented. They were not the flashiest moving. I've had to teach them to use their body in the best way they can. So I've had to do everything correctly because you can't just get on them and be like, off we go because they can do it already. You have to train them like an athlete. You have to make them supple. You have to make them soft. You have to, you have to do it slowly and properly because they won't do it otherwise. So for example, the Grand Prix horse that I've trained, um, he has not naturally got a passage because he just hasn't naturally got a big trot. So we've had to really train him <laughs> properly um, to get it. And I will always be thankful for this because me as a rider, I actually prefer that. I never, it never sat well with me getting on a produced horse and riding that because I just never felt like I was one with the horse. And um, also it, all, it, it comes with its own problems. It seems like a great thing, but it comes with its own problems. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's not at the end of the day, a bad thing for people um, to have to do it that way around. Like I, I preferred doing it that way around. I preferred that I had to do that. I'm, I'm glad that I got put in that position because I don't think I'd be half the rider that I am now if I had just been given produced horses. Um, the other thing as well is that I can teach my clients on their horses that say again are not maybe as naturally talented, some are, some aren't, um, and I know how to teach them, I know how to train them, I know how to make their horse become in better balance, say if it's a little bit built on the forehand, because I've done that with mine. So it has basically set me up so much better than if I had been given very expensive horses to ride. Um, that have been produced for me. So I hope you've enjoyed this video, guys. If you have, make sure to leave a comment below on why you liked it, um, share it with people. And if you have any requests for any more videos you want me to make, just pop it in the comment box below. Make sure to subscribe because I'll be making more videos with the FEI and I'll see you for the next one.